Good evening. Welcome to Christian Life Church Midweek Bible Study Online. We regret that we're not in the house of the Lord yet, but we will be soon if the Lord be willing. Thank you for joining us this evening. We are happy to have all of you here, and I trust that you will just take your Bible, grab your family, sit down for a few minutes, and let's have Bible study together this evening. I want to first of all go to the Lord in prayer for those who are not able to be here. God has truly blessed our church, and uh, as far as I know, we don't have anybody in our church currently suffering from the COVID-19 virus, but we've had a few, but uh, they are all well and doing well, and thank God for that, but uh, we're going to pray for all those who are in need of prayer. There are many needs. We continue to pray for Brother Austin Eubanks, for Clavin and Liz Ship. We pray for Sister Oglethorpe, who is in the nursing home. We have a lot of prayer uh, that needs to go up for those around the country in our state and uh, those who we are associated with who have suffered from the terrible COVID virus. So please remember those things when we pray this evening and pray that God would do a work in uh, the lives of those around us. Would you pray with me right now, right where you are? Father, we come to you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We declare victory. We declare healing. We pray the prayer of faith for those who are not able to be in the house of God and up and about. We pray the presence of God would be upon them right now. Go to every hospital room, every nursing home, into the homes today. Let your presence be felt and your healing power be demonstrated right now. In the name of Jesus, we pray and we give you praise for that. Amen. I remind you, I remind you, and I, I want to mention this. We did not get to have church on Sunday because we did not have electricity until late Saturday night, and we did not know whether it was going to be, in, uh, be on on Sunday, so we called service off Sunday. I know that many of you have suffered and perhaps still suffering with no electricity and no water, and our prayers are with you. If there's anything we can do to help you, please let us know. But we did not get to have church Sunday, uh, our normal Sunday morning service, so we ask you to give. We ask you to uh, not forget that God is important in your life. There are three ways to give here at Christian Life Church. You can give online at our website at clcmonroe.org. There's a place there for you to click on a button and give. You can give by texting to the number 318-301-3601 and just type the word give in there or text the word give and it will show you what to do. So please do that. And then, of course, you can mail your contributions to 6680 Frontage Road, Monroe, Louisiana, 71202. And, of course, you can always bring your your contributions by the office here during the day. We have someone here at the office from 9 until 3. Thank you. God bless you. I do appreciate your faithfulness. Uh, let me say this to you right now. We've, we've had some damage here at the church, not major damage, but we have had some damage. Our sign was damaged pretty well, and uh, we have a few pieces of trim that were torn off. We've got some things that, uh, that we have to fix. We had a power surge last week. And it, uh, it calls a lot of lights and air conditioners out. As a matter of fact, we have one air condition back in the family center that's going to cost us about $14,000. So we need your contributions, and we ask you to remember, even though we're not in the house of God right now, we need for you to, to remember that your church needs you. God bless you, and thank you for giving. We're going right into the Word of the Lord this evening. Proving Grounds. We've been talking about it for the last uh, couple of weeks now. I think three weeks now. And uh, this week we're going to talk about some tests, some proving, some things that God wants us to go through. Let me say this to you. What we're talking about in this series is not things that are detrimental, but things that are opportunity to our spiritual walk with God. They help us to be better Christians, to be uh, better ready for the things that the world and the devil and all the things that come against us. We are proving and we are testing daily. 
Uh, I, I recognize the fact, and you do too, that a new product is not put on the market until it is proven. We recognize that with medicine and with vaccines. We recognize that with all kind of products that proving is very, very important. Testing, making sure that everything is okay. And so that's what we're talking about in this little series. I'll continue where Brother Rory left off last Wednesday evening. We, we talked about, uh, Brother Rory talked about credibility tests. He talked about can you be counted on with the opportunities that you are given. And he talked about the wilderness test. Are you able to make the change progress requires of you? Every one of these tests that we've talked about, everything that we've talked about for the last three weeks are things that come to every individual life, and we are constantly being proven. We, we, either, we either land on one side of the fence or the other. In other words, we either, we either take this test and we pass it for the good, or sometimes we don't pass the test, and guess what? When you don't pass the test... It's coming back to you again. So we want to be on these proving grounds ready to take whatever comes our way that we could be better Christians in our everyday lives. There's three tests that I want to talk to you about. I'll just mention them briefly uh, this, this uh, evening and talk about them not in depth but just, just in a quick way so that you will understand where we are. Remember, these are not things that God allows to come to you to cause you to fail, nor, matter of fact, James said, count it all joy. Count it all joy when you're tested. And he talks on down in James chapter 1 about the testing results. When the results come in, you're going to be a better child of God. You're going to be a better Christian. Go read James chapter 1 when you get time and, and refresh yourself with that because we must count it all joy that God is proving us and testing us to le make sure what we're made out of in a spiritual sense. Let me take you to this. Let's talk about the authority test. This test comes to prove your respect for the authority that God has put in your life. Authority is, is very important. Uh, we're living in a time when, when the world don't like authority. And I believe that God sets up authority. I believe that there are authorities in, in every life and every worthwhile endeavor in society. There's a genuine need for an authority structure. I believe in government. I don't, I don't believe in too much government, but I believe there must be government. God has set it up that way. So what authority actually looks like is dependent upon the system that needs it. There's authority in the church. There's authority on your job. There's authority in your home. There's authority in our everyday lives in, in government. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of talk, and I may be getting in trouble when I say this about defunding police. Let me tell you, that's the last thing we need to do because there must be authority in America for America to be what it really ought to be. And so healthy authority accomplishes the goals that we need to accomplish from principles to presidents, from parents to media personalities, examples of the effects of the healthy authority that are needed everywhere. Unfortunately, there are examples of authority gone wrong, and we understand that. And that result can be very disastrous, both in our normal everyday lives and in our spiritual lives. Jesus was no stranger to the concept of authority as a part of a Jewish family that uh, was living in the territory of Roman rule at the time and the Roman Empire, Jesus understood the impart, importance and the complexity of authority, both good and bad. In Matthew chapter 22, Jesus provided a great example of authority. There was a group of Pharisees and Herodians hoping to get Jesus to say something controversial and ask him whether he should pay tax to Caesar. 
Well, they were trying to trick him and they were trying to cause him to say the wrong thing. For Jesus to say that they should pay tax would be seen as dishonoring his own religion and his own heritage. But if he were to say that they should not pay a tax, then they would call him a revolutionary in the eyes of the Romans. But instead, Jesus did not give a yes or no answer. He was so wise, but he respected authority. Here's what he said to them in Matthew chapter 22. Therefore, you render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. The answer shows that in most cases, we, we, we can pass the authority test by being respectable to those in authority. Developing a proper attitude toward authority. You know, there's, there's, uh, there's a lot of folks in our world, a teenage world and uh, the younger world, that is in revolt of authority. But if we struggle with these people telling us what to do, the test will reveal it. The test will reveal it. If we resent those over us, the test will reveal it. If we despise those in authority and uh, having privileges that we don't have, the test will reveal it. Our greatest test of, of this principle comes when we disagree with authority. We, we, the authority test is, is, is very important in our lives because we, we, cannot, we cannot be those in rebellion. Our, our church, our personal lives, our spiritual lives must respect authority. You must respect the authority in your life. Now, I don't believe you ought to respect and follow after authority that would lead you spiritually wrong. There would come a time that if, if someone would attack the scriptures, that we would stand for the scriptures. Or if someone would attack the principles of the word of God. You can't just follow after people. But there's a way to do things peacefully. And, and personally, I believe, very uh, Christian-like where you don't have to define yourself as a rebel in a community or a nation or a world or a state or your home or, or your job. You can disagree, and sometimes you have to agree to disagree when something crosses the principles of the Scriptures. But we must be aware of three things, three things that can help us develop a good attitude toward authority. Let me say that. Number one, an awareness of authority. Locate those in position of authority in your life. Do you accept them as authority in your life? Do you admit they have positions which place them in authority in your life? Do you find yourself reluctant to be equal uh, or trying to be equal with them? Or when we are willing to acknowledge positions of authority that exist in our life, we're acknowledging that the things that God set up in our life. There's a reason there's a government. There's a reason. Can you imagine a world without any government? Can you imagine a state or a city without any government? Can you imagine a church without any government? I want to tell you, one of the most damnable times in the Old Testament, there's a scripture that said, and in those days every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Let me tell you, that is a damnable time for any life. You cannot just do what you want to do. God set up authority. There are areas of authority which have to exist in our life. They exist in your family. They exist on your job. They exist at your church. They exist at your school and in your community and in your government and in your nation. Don't forget that. Number two, here's another thing that will help you develop a good attitude toward authority, to experience what it's like to be in and under authority. You have to experience that. The centurion came to Jesus and he said, I, I want you to heal my son, my child. And he said, for I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. And he said, I tell you, I tell one go and he goes and I tell another one come and he comes and I say to my servant, do this and he does it. That's all found in Luke chapter seven. But then he went on to say, I know Lord 
that you have authority and you can just speak the word. So what he was saying is I've experienced authority and so my attitude toward authority is that I know you, Lord, can heal my child just by speaking the word. It's a good attitude toward authority. I've seen a lot of bad attitudes, but if you're going to pass the test of life, you have to pass the authority test. And number three, you got to accept God's word concerning authority. You got to accept God's word. Could I read you some scripture just for a moment here this evening? What does the Bible say about authority? What does it say? Well, here's one verse in Romans chapter 13 and verse 1. The Bible said, let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. For there is no power but of God, the powers that be are ordained of God. So it's saying there's authority in your life. Let every soul be subject to higher powers. And then Colossians chapter 3 and verse 18. This is one that some of you won't like, but here it is, and it's in the Word of God. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as it is fit in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing unto the Lord. Fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. Servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart fearing God. Hebrews 13 and, and, and uh, 17 says this. This is very important. Listen closely. It's talking about the church. Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves for they watch for your souls as they, must, they that must give account that they may do it with joy and not with grief for that is unprofitable for you. You got to pass the authority test. Women, submit yourself to your husband. That's the scriptures. Men, submit yourself to God. That's the scriptures. Everybody has to submit themselves to God. Church, obey those that have rule over you. There's authority in the church. Everybody is not on the same level of authority. It, it, it is a very bad situation when children are the, uh, the authority in the home and not the parents. When the kids at school are the authority and not the principal. When the people of the nation are the authority and not the law. That's what you're seeing happening in our world. But we got to pass the authority test because it's in the word of God. When that authority fails, our attitude is sometime revealed. And uh, it's important that you follow after the right people, the right things. If, if there's a, an authority in your life, that fails and fails miserably, I'm talking about spiritually or, or any other way, there's a right way to get out from under that authority. A wrong decision by someone in authority is a reason for you to remove yourself from that sphere of authority. A moral failure by someone in authority is a reason for you to remove yourself. Immature actions by someone in authority is often a reason. Sometimes you may have to leave a job because the authority over you is immature or they're immoral or they're childish in their action and immature in their action. Unfair Treatment by someone in authority is a reason that you may have to remove yourself. Discrimination is a reason. But let me tell you, we cannot take every authority and be so judgmental because we're not there and just say, I don't believe in authority. The authority test is very, very important. And let me promise you this, God is always going to try you and he's going to test you to see if you are under the authority that is in your life. Let me give you two things that you need to do if you are questioning or wondering or saying to yourself, I don't believe that's right, that authority's wrong, I, I disagree with that. Number one, you gotta appeal to a higher authority. 
I've had people come to me and say, Pastor, my job, my boss has given me fits. There's no reason. I'm doing my job. I, I said, let's pray. You know what? God can remove your, your boss. You say, well, that's terrible. No. That's turning to the authority of a higher power. You can appeal your case to God, and God can set the authority in your, in your life wrong. Peaceful withdrawal from the authority's jurisdiction or sphere of power. Don't be ugly, and don't get a bad attitude. Just remove yourself peacefully from that authority. There are many other things that I could say. There's a whole Bible lesson on authority, but we've got to pass the authority test. Now, let me talk to you about the warfare test very quickly. The warfare test. This test occurs when you are in the will of God and you're experiencing adversity. Ladies and gentlemen, we're in a battle. This is a war. We are in spiritual warfare every day. One mistake, one of the mistakes that people make is to assume that if God wants you to have something, that you won't have to fight for it. That is a big mistake. You won't have to plan for it. You won't have to work for it. You don't have to do anything. God's just going to lay it in your lap. That thought has caused a lot of people to miss out on the blessings and the opportunities and the progress that God has in their lives. The warfare test. You, God didn't call you to take a nightgown and go to bed and say everything's going to be all right. He called you into a spiritual warfare. And that's where we are. And we have to pass the warfare test. You got to have some fight in you. You got to have some warrior attitude in you. I'm talking about spiritual things now. I'm not talking about being hard to get along with on the job or hard to get along with in your home. That's not the warfare we're looking for. But the warfare test occurs when you're in the will of God and, and you're experiencing adversity in your life. Mark Twain said it best when he said this, it's not the size of the dog that's in the fight, but it's the size of the fight that's in the dog. Somewhere you got to rise up and fight with the, the spiritual enemy and the things that come against you. People sometimes that have less talent have more fight. And so they go further than the talented person who is refusing to fight and face adversity. The war test, the warfare test comes into your life to prove how well you're going to respond to adversity. Jesus himself faced the warfare test. Here's what he did. He got out to pray. And, and before Calvary, before the cross, in the Garden of Gethsemane, he understood the warfare. He understood what he was up against. And this is what he said, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, notice that word. He said, not my will, but your will. I want your will to be done. I'm going to fight my way through this. You got to have the heart of a champion. You got to refuse to be a quitter. I have a favorite saying, and it's this Winners never quit, and quitters never win. If you fail God, you got to get up. If you lose a battle, that don't mean you've lost the war. Just because you lose a battle don't mean you lost the war. The war is still on. If you made a mistake, get up. Brush the dirt off your knees. Wipe the dust off your hands. And say, you know what? I fail, but I'm fighting again. I'm here to fight another day. You gotta have the heart of a champion. You gotta be a person with inner strength. And, 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 and it's commonly described with a lot of heart. You gotta have a heart for God. Let me tell you, and I'm just being honest with you, living for God is not for sissies. Living for God is not easy because you're going the opposite direction on a one-way street. They're all going this way, you're going that way. That's why you got to have a lot of heart. It's the choice of a champion, not, not can I do it, but have I decided to do it? I'm going to tell you, not a lot of champion football teams and basketball teams and 
any other team. They may not have the greatest talent, but they sometime have the greatest heart. You got to know where you're going and you got to make a decision in your life that you'll fight the good fight of faith. It's a warfare test. Are you in it to win or are you going to be a sissy and go sit in the stands and watch what's going on in the field? You got to get in the fight. I love Joshua. I love Joshua, the Old Testament, a man, a man that stood up for what is right, but he said this, but if so, he said this to, to those around him. He said, if serving the Lord seem undesirable to you, I'm reading out of the NIV, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your forefathers served beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. He said this, here's the warrior. He said, but as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. <coughs> Pardon me. He said, no matter what you do, no matter what anybody else does, I'm going to pass the warfare test. I'm in this thing to the fight and finish. I'm not going to give up. Comfort is way overrated. And commitment is very underrated. I'm in this thing to the final bail. I won't, get, I won't quit getting up when I fall. I won't quit walking. I won't quit marching. Because as for me and my house, we have decided we're going to serve the Lord. And once you make that decision, then your will to win becomes your goal. It's, it's the thing that matters most in your life. Ladies and gentlemen, could I be honest with you today? Nothing matters more than winning this warfare test. Nothing matters more. You know why? Because at the end of the day, your cars and your houses and your, your things and your stuff and the things that we think are so important are all going to melt away. But the warfare test in your life is going to be what matters because when all that's gone, there's an eternity and there's a God that we have to stand before. Your future and your family's future is being shaped right now as to whether or not you decide what you're going to do with the call of God in your life. Your children are at stake. Your family is at stake. You got to be able you got to be able to hang in there. You got to be able to take a punch. There's some coming. Every champ, cha, uh, champion has got to learn to take adversity. You got to learn to take the punch and keep fighting. That's why Paul said, he said in 2 Corinthians, we are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. You can, you can throw all that at me, Paul said, but you won't find me quitting because I have made up my, time, my mind to win this warfare test. You got to pass it. Napoleon Hill made a great statement. He said, every adversity, every failure, every heartache carries with it the seed of a greater uh, of an equal or greater benefit. Listen to it again. Every adversity, every failure, and every heartache carries with it the seed of an equal or greater benefit. So based on Jesus' experience in the garden, based on what we know in everyday life, let me tell you, it matters that you win the warfare test because in the end, Jesus was victorious over death, hell, and the grave. Jesus was walked out of the keys with the keys of the kingdom in his hand from, from hell. He took the keys of death away. He took the keys of hell away. He still holds them. The warfare test, you gotta win it and you gotta win it big. The, qu the question is, are you willing and do you have a heart of a champion? <clears throat> the last test that I want to talk about this evening is called the offense test. Wow. This test comes to prove that you are not easily offended and that you, you the, have the potential to readily forgive others. You refuse to live an offended state. Now, don't get me wrong. Everybody gets their feelings hurt. 
Everybody gets offended at times. But are you going to let circumstances and situations cause you to live a life that is offended? Jesus said, it is impossible that no offenses should come. People are going to hurt your feelings. You're going to get offended on your job. You're going to get offended in the church. You're going to get offended in your family. Everywhere you go, there's offenses coming. Sometimes you'll be called a name. Sometimes somebody will slander you. Somebody, somebody may say something that's totally untrue about you. But holding on to offense doesn't hurt everybody else. It hurts you. It hurts you. It's like drinking poison and hoping that the other person will die. Did you hear me? It's like drinking poison and hoping the other guy will die. You get, you get this attitude and, and you become defensive. John the Baptist was a, <clears throat> was a great man. The Bible said, Jesus said, there's none greater than John the Baptist. But I want you to see something about John the Baptist. He had, he had come out of the wilderness. He had baptized Jesus. He had all these marvelous things in his life. And now he's in prison. And John the Baptist sent to Jesus and he asked him, are you the one? Are you the one? You the one I've been preaching about. You the one that I've been talking about. Are you the one? John said that because he was looking at his own circumstances and very possibly allowing resentment and offense to sit in his spirit. Watch this. Based on the story, we could assume that he was having thoughts like, I was here first. Why is he getting all the attention? Why am I the one that's actually suffering in prison here? <clears throat> I'm suffering, and he's out there getting all the glory. Jesus sent back to John in Matthew 11. Here's what he said. Go and tell John the things which you hear and see. The blind see and the lame walk. The lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up and the poor have the gospel preached to them. Now watch this. And he said, tell John this. Blessed is he who is not offended because of me. John, don't get an attitude. This is what you live for. This is, you're not getting the glory. But let me tell you, blessed is he that is not offended because the things I'm doing or the things I'm saying and life seems so unfair and so inconsiderate, but don't be offended. John seems to be feeling offended from the prison cell. But Jesus said, you go tell him what's happening and then tell him this, don't be offended, don't be offended because I'm doing these things. So there, there's, there's a place in all of us to get offended, but you can't stay offended. You're going to feel feelings, feelings of hurt, feelings of pain, feelings of why am I here? Why am I going through this? But could I be honest with you today? You cannot live in an offended state. People that live that way are people that's mad, people that have a scowl on their face, people that have an attitude, and people, well, everybody's against me, and uh, look, look what's come against me. And I've watched people that got offended and quit the church and quit living for God and walked out on God. I wish I could read to you. I wouldn't do it for anything. But I received this week, I received someone shot me a, a text of a man that was once a Christian. As a matter of fact, he was once a preacher. And he got offended. And he became very bitter. And last week, he committed suicide. I wish I could read it to you. First place, I wouldn't do that. But it's very, some of the things in there are very vulgar and very mad and very bitter and very angry. And when I read it and I showed it to my wife, I said, can you believe this? Who would want to die this way? But this man died out of bitterness and, be, and, and living a life of being offended. You can't live that life. An opportunity for, a, for offense is not only a trap, it's the bait of the devil. It's a test, but it's also a bait 
of the devil. The Lord wants to know, are you going to have a good, you know what the Bible said? I love this scripture. I, I quote it to myself all the time. The spirit of a man is the candle of the Lord. Your right spirit will shine like a bright light in your community, in your family, in your life. There's a difference between temporary feeling of offense and a mental and spiritual state of offense. You're not hurting others when you live that way. You are hurting yourself. So, so the, great, the great test of, of offense, it's coming. It's, it's, it's there probably daily in your life. It's easy to get uncomfortable and mad, but you can't let it get in your spirit. The Bible said, be angry and sin not. Be angry and sin not. You, you, you have to live a life of forgiveness and a life of love. And love will overcome when you're offended. Have I ever been offended? Oh, oh, yes, many, many times. But I want to tell you what I've tried to practice in my own life. And I'm not, any, I'm not anywhere near the great example. Please don't take me that way. But here's what I believe. When you get offended, get over it. Don't let it eat on you like a cancer. And this is what I've tried to do. I've tried to forgive those that offended me. And I've tried to look beyond the faults of those that offended me. I refuse to live in a state of offense all my life. You'll wake up angry. You'll go to bed angry. And the first thing you know, the bitterness. The Bible said, let's spring up with you in you any root of bitterness. When it grows, it becomes a lifestyle and, and you become a miserable person. Let me give you a scripture in closing. Psalms chapter 119, the longest chapter of the Bible. In verse number 165, it said, great peace. Have them... Or have they which love the law, and nothing, nothing shall offend them. Nothing, nothing. Let them say what they want to say. Let them do what they want to do. Let them be what they want to be. So here I am this evening talking about three more tests. Tests that every one of us are going to go through. We're not exempt from tests. It's coming our way. It's what we have to go through. The proving grounds. The proving grounds. The authority test. It's coming to every one of you. You're going to find out if you're living under authority. Do you believe that today? The authority test is so important in your life. Don't, don't, don't ever think for a minute that everything's okay and everything's going to be beyond you when you have authority. The offense test, it's coming. Those things that we talk about, the warfare test, they're coming. Don't ever think that you're not going to go through every one of them. It's proving grounds. It's your opportunity to stand up and say, hey, I'm better than this. I'm, I'm wiser than this. I'll get over this. I'll respect my authority. Look, let me be honest with you. You may not have voted for the mayor that is a mayor or the congressman that's a congressman or the president that's the president, but they're an authority in our life, so we honor them. You may not have, you may not have chosen your parents. You didn't choose your parents, but they're an authority in your life. They're an authority. If you go to church, then the pastor has authority in your life. And if you don't let him have authority in your life, you're not going to be saved. The Bible says, submit yourselves. These are they that watch out for your souls. I'm paraphrasing now. They got to give an account for you. These are things that are important. The offense test. Don't live an offended life. Don't walk around with a chip on your shoulder all the time. Just be offended and pray and get over it and move on. Because the offense test is coming to every one of us. I love you. I hope that helps you on a Wednesday evening. Sunday morning we will have church here. 10 o'clock. Please be in the house of the Lord. We are quickly, quickly nearing the day when we will be back on Wednesday evenings also. And we are quickly nearing the day when our youth and our children will be back where they need to be. And I hope that is just a few days away. I love you so much. God bless you.
pass the test. Let God prove you. Let God show you. Let God be upon you and live your life on the proving grounds to prove that you are truly a child of God. May God bless you today.